New products. It's new product time. Okay, so we have updates to the onion pie pack. This is the, we had, we mentioned this last week, but now we have all the photos and everything. So what did you update? Uh, this is the onion pie pack with the big antenna, and uh, it now comes with the model B plus and our nice B plus case. Uh, we also went through the tutorial and made sure it worked with the latest Raspbian, so it is good to go. And then the parts list, you can, you can see the parts in the next photo. The next photo. Um, got Ethernet cable, console cable, one of our nice power supplies, Raspberry Pi model B plus. Because uh, you need Ethernet, you can't use an A plus for this project um, case. Um, SD card and Wi-Fi. And the other one? And then the other one, we upgraded the little um, Wi-Fi chip into like a stick one, which we found that people are having difficulty sometimes. The little one, it doesn't have the best range, so we wanted to upgrade to the stick. So um, just, you know, basically same parts, except it has a smaller Wi-Fi chip. And we even lowered the price because we've been able to get better pricing on stuff. So I think it's like $10 less now even to get the uh, onion pie pack. So build an onion pie. Yeah. And I guess just a side note, um, and you just can do it in a sentence or so, what is Tor? Uh, Tor is, uh, in, in this case, um, Tor is acting as an anonymizing proxy so that your IP address doesn't show up on the computer that you're accessing. So what the Onion Pi does is you connect the Ethernet cable from the Raspberry Pi to your cable modem or your Wi-Fi router or whatever. And then um, the Onion Pi acts as a Wi-Fi router on its own. But any traffic that comes in on the Wi-Fi adapter, like your tablet or your phone or your Kindle, anything that you want that doesn't normally allow you to like run a Tor proxy on it, you can connect to this Wi-Fi module, uh, this uh -huh. Wi-Fi router, and will automatically anonymize your information. So like so if you have an iPad or something, that, that doesn't run Tor. You, can you use, can't run Tor. You can on, use yeah. this. Um, or like a Chromebook or whatever. Anything where you, yeah. you have no control over the ability. To, if you can install Tor, install Tor, of course. You don't have to buy anything for that. Yeah. But if you want to have it um, be a, a Wi-Fi router as well, yeah. that can allow you to use Wi-Fi, then this is where it comes in very handy. And one you know, note, um, Lady A and I had exactly like two hours of free time on Sunday, and so we decided to go see Citizen Four, and it's the Edward Snowden story. No matter what you think about the whole thing that happened, you have to watch it if you're a technologist, because they presented everything on how PGP is used and how um, encryption is used and what they all the steps that had to happen. It's fascinating just on that front alone, and it's a very interesting story. So, um, and he had a tour sticker. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and and he had a tour sticker on his laptop. So, anyways, that was kind of uh, interesting. So, uh, it's a movie that uh, you liked it. I liked it. I thought it was an interesting movie that was documenting a modern technology thing and there was no like fake flying through servers and everything like the movies hackers is fun but it's like you know campy in that way this is actually a documentary about something that happened yeah so all right next up what are these this is a 20 by uh two uh, dual pin socket actually the next photo is a little bit clearer what it is okay it's what you can plug in an idc cable like the raspberry pi gpio cable and it acts as a socket so it's the other side so if you would like to um, make a circuit board that a raspberry pi would connect to this way you can run the cable from the pi to the socket um, you can also solder it into our hats so you can from the top instead of the connector that comes with it if you want to run a cable instead. We'll show how to do that later. Mm. But it's just a basic connector. We use it in, you know, our pie cobblers and such. So if you basically want to do that without the cobbler part, then this is a basic connector that you can use. Okay. Next up. Where are these little things? Sockets. Sockets. We finally have sockets in the store. We've been using these. They're some of the oldest components we use. We use them in all our kits. But now we finally have them on their own and you get them in three packs. This is eight pin sockets, two by four pins. Can we call our show sockets? And now it is the time we dance. Do, 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 do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess we'll keep calling Ask an Engineer. All yeah. right. So that you can put them on these things. So you can solder them into a Perm Proto, for example. That's what they're best used for. They should not be used with a solderless breadboard because the pins, well, first off, solderless breadboard, you can already plug in sockets and then remove them. Yeah. But this basically allows you to solder in a socket instead of the chip. It's the same size as the chip. And that way, if you have to remove the chip to reprogram it or because it got damaged or you put it in backwards, you can do that very easily with a socket. And sockets are very inexpensive compared to chips. Okay. So it is recommended. So we got a bunch of other sockets. You yes. want to go through each one? Yeah, this is a 14-pin uh, uh, socket, 2x7. You can just click through. Yeah. This is for bigger chips. Usually logic chips are usually this big, some small. My controller, this is 2x8, 16-pin socket, I believe, or is it 2x? Hold on. i got to look to make sure what I got. 
Got to get your socket straight. I got two by straight. eight. I got two by is it twenty. Yeah, sorry, that was a sixteen pin, and then this is a uh, twenty pin. Okay, and then I got more. Just, okay, more. these are the weird ones. So this is a two by fourteen. This is a twenty-eight pin socket, but it's the wide kind. And sometimes you get e proms, especially, or some like A6, some older chips. Um, if you want to uh, use them, they come and also some seven segment displays. I've known some LED displays. Um, you can use a 0.6 inch wide 28 pin socket. Okay. And, and then this is, yeah. So then there's the 40 pin 28, uh, sorry, 40 pin 0.6 inch sockets. These are for really big chips. Um, we use it for like a Parallax propeller or like or at mega, you know, 8051 or whatever. Some really big chips, really like, yeah, you can see here, these, these chunky chips, they tend to use 40 pin chips, often have 0.6 inch spacing. And then we also, oh, we didn't get a photo of the 28 pin wide. It's okay, I'll show it on the overhead. Quick, to the overhead. There's one more socket, but I also get to show all the different sizes of sockets in a row. <laughs> Thank goodness we so have this, this overhead. Is, so this is the 40 pin, so you can see the big chips. And then we also have the, the 28 pin wide. And then we also have the 28 pin narrow which is like used with the Atmega 28. Oh, wait one second, let me do a uh, lock. Um, so this is the same number of pins, but this is the wide version, skinny version. Do not confuse these, because this happens a lot and people are sad. And then some LPC chips come with um, uh, this, this width as well, some uh, NXP LPC chips. Um, and then we have, this is the 20 pin, and this is the eight pin, and this is the 16 pin. So I kind of got the biggest size. So you're like, well, why don't you carry like every single size? Well, that's a good point. So <laughs> basically I tried why to Why don't you carry every single size? Because I didn't want to carry so. <laughs> I wanted to carry the most common sizes, but here's a trick. You don't actually have to use all the different pins. So if you have, you know, something that's a 14 pin chip, you can use a 26 pin socket and you can just cut it off with like, um, you can just cut off like the legs that you don't need to use. So. You know, whatever. Like these are the most popular ones. If like if there's a chip that like really would benefit from having a socket, we'll try to carry it. But these are the only sockets I've ever really needed in my life. The eight pin ones are like super common. Twenty eight pin for at mega chips, and then these for like logic chips or other little at tiny chips. And this is for like e proms or like weird chips. And then this is for like you know propellers and 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 larger chips. So you got all the different sockets, and they come in a pack of three, and they come in foam, so that when you get them, the pins are nice and straight. Okay. Ready to go. All right. So to me. I, I think the most, um, I mean, we have a couple more products to go, okay. uh, but I want to spend a little bit of time on this because we might run out of time tonight. So this is probably the most asked about product recently. So We've been getting three emails a day yeah, asking us to carry And this. it's this really low cost Wi-Fi thing. And um, we have it in the store. We're loading it up with the latest and greatest firmware. Um, I guess before you say what it is, why, why do you think people are just going bonkers over these? Um, this is like basically the lowest cost way to add Wi-Fi to like an Arduino microcontroller type thing. Like Raspberry Pi, you should just grab a USB Wi-Fi dongle because it's like it, you know it's USB and it's easy and the drivers are included. But this is like a USB. Sorry, it's a UART to Wi-Fi converter chip, and it's basically extremely low cost. Like these little modules are only a couple bucks. So we, we picked up a bunch of these modules and we, we, we used them a bit and we found that um, the default firmware they come with that kind of sucks, but we found some other firmware and we tried all the different ones and we found one that like it's kind of like the least sucky of all of them. And basically it's, it's low cost, but it's not low power. And it's also not super easy to use. Like you can kind of use it, it kind of works. Like it works, but it's just not, it's not like hardened and it's not, it's, it's for hobbyists. It's not like, I wouldn't put this in a product, definitely. Um, the chip itself has FCC certification, but like this module, for example, has not been. So it's for experimenters and hobbyists and people who want to like play around with it. Mm. Does it work it, like a Trinket Pro if you wanted to work it? You around? could use it with a Trinket Pro. Um, you probably need level uh, shifting for the five volt Trinket against three volt power, three volt logic. It uses a lot of power, so you need an external regulator. So there's like, we don't have a tutorial for it yet. There's a great website that we link yeah. to in the tutorial, in the product page that has tutorials. It's a little, you know, it works. It requires, here's like my example, I use these wires because you can't plug into a breadboard. Um, I think it's an interesting chip. We'll have some, you know, I wrote some like code that really works quite well for it and it's up on GitHub. So if you're using these modules, uh, do check out my code because I tried all the other code out there and like it was, um, it was okay. 
but I think I, I wrote better code yeah. um, that lets you use software serial and, and like gets the data and you can parse it very quickly and it grabs a web page. Okay. So you know, right now we're just carrying it for experiment experimentation, hobbyist use. We don't have a tutorial quite yet. We don't really guarantee that it's going to solve your problems. <laughs> we don't really this guarantee. It might cause more that problems in your it life. It might cause more problems in your yeah. life. Uh, but we get these and we load these up with the latest firmware and we actually do some tests on them. We, we test, we program it and then test it. Yeah. So when you're getting it from us, you're actually, you know that it, it's at least going to work with our code. Okay. Um, so enjoy. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe make a little breakout for this, breakout helper or another chip. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll do some more with this, but this is just to get people started and, and do check it out. Maybe okay. we'll do a tutorial later. All right. Next up. This is that uh, haptic thing that you're working on, right? Yeah, this is the haptic chip I talked about earlier. This is the DRV2605. This is a... Uh, Haptic motor driver, it drives a vibration motor and it has effects built into it. It's like about a hundred different effects like double click and like pulse on and off and like ramp up and ramp down and like all these different effects and like sinusoidal and it can also like take audio and, and turn that into an audio to vibration effect board. And it uses I squared C and you can basically, instead of you having to deal with having a motor driver, because these motors like still need motor drivers. It's kind of a motor driver, controller, library, all-in-one chip. It's kind of an all-in-one chip that sort of does everything. You solder on a vibration or a haptic motor onto the little pads over there, and then you control over I2C. And I can just show, I mean, you guys won't be able to feel this because we don't have feel vision but- um, Not yet. Not yet. Chrome, but, Chrome version 50 has feel vision um, It's in beta. So I can kind of make it, like vibrate. I can hear it. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll put it up to my mic. So you can hear it's kind of doing. Yeah. Zoop. It's gonna look kind of frog. So that's like, <laughs> so it's vibrating up and then clicking. So you can tile together a bunch of different effects, and it will go through the effects in order as you want. You can do like a lot of different weird stuff. So you can do like in handheld games, or it's used in phones, or you know tablets or whatever. That was kind of an interesting chip because it, it does something that I've never seen another chip do. There are motor drivers and you could kind of do this on your own, but this chip like does it all for you. It's very nice, a very okay. fancy chip. Next up, um, this is kind of an interesting story. Leslie, who uh, works with Becky and our wearable hmm. electronics department, suggested that we check this cool kit out. She told the makers, the makers came on the show and tell, we liked the kit so much, we said, hey, we want to stock this. And now we have it, and that was the thing that you were wearing. It is a skull kit, and here is Shalise. Skull. Shalise works in our kitting department. She assembled one. She's also a jeweler herself. So That's we right. said, make sure this is a cool kit. So she liked it. We liked it. We decided to stock it, and um, we like skulls. So this is the... Yeah, can we go to the overhead? Because it's small. i gotta, I got to show it on the overhead. Let's go to the overhead. Okay, so it's a PCB kit. Um, and this one's fully assembled, but it comes as a kit normally. And it's like a skull effect. It has these LEDs. And what's cool is there's no battery. It actually uses a super cap right here. And you can see these little jewel-looking things. They're actually solar cells. So it has a little um, LED blinking. Maybe it's like a 555. I'm actually not 100% sure what it is because it's kind of covered right now. Um, and it... Uh, you can charge a super cap using the solar cells so if you're outside or if you have bright office lighting you can you can charge it that way or you can just plug into USB and it will charge a super cap instantly and then um, you can turn it on and it will blink the eyes I don't know if we can get the blinking to show up blink. hold on you know what I should probably charge it before I let me try charging it blink come on Oh no! I think I didn't. I think I have to charge it for a few seconds. I'll come back to it. But it was blinking yeah, earlier. Yeah, I can see it. I know. I was wearing it for the entire show. Um, so yeah. you can do solar, or you can charge it over USB. It takes a couple seconds. It'll charge it up, and it's a, a necklace that you can wear. It doesn't come with a cord, but you can use like any cord. Okay. With it. And do you want to try it now before I go? I just can't squeeze that. Yeah, it was blinking. Oh, you know what? Oh, there you go. Sorry, I had the switch on the off position. So there you go. Blinking back blink, and blink, forth. Blink, blink, blink. So it just blinks the eyes quite nicely. Yeah, it's cool. You can see. Okay, oh, yeah. and if you want to get it, blink. here's a nice photo close up. And this is what it looks like on a person. Next up, we have okay. so a gotta, book. Gotta wear this. Sylvia's Super Awesome Project Book Volume 2, Super Simple Arduino. If you're looking for one of the best beginner books out there from an amazing maker, um, there's uh, photos of you and Sylvia. We've seen her at Maker Fairs. Uh, many years, and Sylvia is one of the rising maker stars, so she has all these cool projects that you can do with an Arduino. If you go to the Make site, you can see the Super uh, Sylvia Super Awesome Show. Um, that cartoon Arduino. It's it's a it's a very basic book. Yeah. 
but it's also good. Like sometimes you want something very simple, especially something very kid friendly, to get a young person or written, a young at heart person. Written by a young maker for young makers. So um, this is really a really good book. It's uh, selling really fast too. So um, we have an email out to. Um, Sylvia and her folks, we want to make a little pack that goes along with it. So um, email us, call us. We'd like to do that. Um, next up. This is um, one of the best maker skills books out there. This is a beautiful, this beautiful This is from book. Chris Hackett, um, Popular Science. Um, I used to be contributing editor there, and I can tell you that they make the best magazines, resource books, everything. This is a beautiful, gorgeous book with amazing photography, and it's probably, I'm just going to call it the, the best, uh, if you want to go in the overhead. Oh, sorry. I think it's the best design um, maker book out there that I've seen recently. It is gorgeous. The, the layout, the typography, um, everything about it is just fantastic. It's a really, really, really beautiful book. And we get a lot of books in here. And not that they're not all beautiful, but we definitely, like the design and readability of a book is really important because if you're not gonna actually read it, it's not that important. Um, it's not that useful. So this is a book that has really great diagrams, um, has beautiful layout, so it shows you all the tools at once, all the different kinds of wrenches. Yeah. Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. Yeah, we're, well, I have to we're zoom zoomed out all the way. Yeah, I have to, it's tough. This is a, it's actually a, a big book. It's a big book. The pages are um, nice and thick, and it's all in color, and there's great photos, and um, I, I really, really, really like this book, and the cover's embossed very beautifully. This is um, a really, really nice book. Really, really nice. Like whoever designed this and worked on it, um, yeah, popular science cared a lot. Stuff. Okay, and then um, these are uh, last but not least. We have two hats, pie hats. So these are kind of the stars of the show, lady. What are these pie hats? Okay, it's time for the pie hat party to begin. Uh, quite a while ago, I started designing some hats. We have a approximately 10 hats in progress, various levels of progress from thought to uh, now in the store. And this is the first one. We want to start with a proto hat because, hey, you know, time to prototype. So we have two flavors of this hat. One has an EEPROM and one does not. This one doesn't. It's, and then you, if you did, it would have little black stuff in the corner. And every hat uh, from the Raspberry Pi Foundation has a standard, like you have to have an EEPROM, and then when you plug it in, the Pi can know what hat's plugged in because it, it looks for the EEPROM. Uh, soldered on. But that means you can't stack two hats because the EEPROMs collide in the address space. So we have a version that doesn't have the EEPROM. And so you can solder on an EEPROM later if you'd like, or you can just use it for prototyping and if you don't want to have to use the hat manager. That's cool. And then for people who do want to have an EEPROM on there so they can make a custom hat and then use the hat tools that the Pi Foundation has released um, to make it so the Pi knows what it's connected to and maybe sets up the GPIOs and like loads modules and device trees and stuff based on you know what it is on the proto board. We have that version as well. So let's explain the two yeah, different let's, versions. Let's go to the, uh, we have some beautiful photos as always, but let's also just um, look at it. Okay. Live. Live. Um, so this is the PCB as you get it, and this one has the EEPROM down here, so you can see this little, little chunk of stuff over here. So this is the EEPROM and the resistors. So this version has it, and then I think this version, which is soldered, does not. And um, it comes as just the PCB and a socket. And the reason it does not come assembled is because we want to make it so you can easily replace the header with a stackable header, extra tall header. Also, we have various different um, types of headers that you might want to connect. Like, can you go to, we have one photo with the stacking header. I think it's that this one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hide me? No, I don't want to hide you. Okay, but maybe. I'm going to move, move, I'm going to move okay. this off to the side, maybe. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, all right, you can kind of see it. So you see how the pins, like right here, are extra long? That means you can stack another hat on top. You can plug in a GPIO cable. So if you want, you can pick up one of those and solder it in instead. Basically, the same as the stacking headers that we use for Arduino shields, but this is a stacking header for hats. And so I do this when I want to like prototype something, but also have like a Pi TFT or display on top. So, and you can also like, you know, debug and, and clip onto the hats as necessary, uh, the GPI pins as necessary. So we have um, this really beautiful white silk screen and it's got um, all the pins except for number 26 brought out. Number 26 doesn't make it, there's not enough space. Yeah. It has uh, gold pads, um, this is the connector, it has the mounting holes, it has slots for the cable and um, camera. And then on the back you can see the connection grid. So it uses basically the same kind of grid as a breadboard where all these um, pins are rows. And then um, we also have 
power and ground rails over here, and they're also marked here quite nicely. This is the ground rail. It's hard to see here, but in the photo you can see it, but there's a red line or a blue line that goes all the way through, and black lines that go through this way. So you can see, without having to flip it over, what's connected to what. So this is very basic. It's low cost, very simple. Uh, hat and wanted to get as much prototyping space while also letting all the slots through and having the EEPROM. So it's a basic hat. We'll be coming up with more hats, but this is the first hat. Yeah, I like how it... And that was your hat of the day. <laughs> yeah, and I like how you thought about all the types of projects that people would do with it, and then you made these hats around that. So I Yeah, it works on the A+, plus or the B+, plus. Yeah. Raspberry Pi. It's not meant for the Model B or the Model A. These hats are a B+, plus, A+, plus thing only. Yeah. But it's okay because... Now people are getting the B plus and the A plus. Okay. And of course it fits very nicely onto the B plus in our case. So if you want something that embeds into the case. Well, did it. That was new products. Good work. All right. You did it. Okay. Whew.